Good morning, everyone. Uh, we uh, will be addressing this morning uh, subject of uh, a right to privacy or a religious uh, mandate for privacy. We'll see the two may not be the same thing. And part of this came from a headline. I felt once I saw the blog or the website that had this headline, I figured I have to build a sheer around it no matter what. Because this is source number one. It comes from Hefgervelt. Can't do better than a, uh, a blog called Hefgervelt. Um, you know, the world is, uh, I guess it's, it, the world is there for the taking. Either that or the world is completely uh, disorganized uh, or run amok, and maybe both are kind of true. But uh, so this is from Hefgervelt, a um, yeshivish uh, ultra-Orthodox blog uh, out of Lakewood. Lakewood Hatsala launches ad campaign against the practice of listening in to Hatsala calls with scanners and posting pictures of accident scenes on public forums and websites. The ads say, would you peek into other people's houses? Would you listen in other people's phone calls? Then why would you listen to other people's hot solo calls? Right, so that was the, 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 the post and the, that was the uh, Lakewood hot solo uh, undertaking, right? For those who are not familiar, there are these things called scanners uh, that uh, listen to the various uh, frequencies that people are, are speaking on. Uh, the, 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 these, in my recollection, were much more uh, prominent back in the days of CB uh, radio communication. I remember the CB, uh, those are the truckers have, and you know there was a time, I will admit it, as a youngster that I really wanted my parents to get a CB because you wanna to talk to people or talk to the truck drivers while you're driving. And how else are you gonna to talk to someone when you're driving? Because there's no other way, because there were no cell phones. In any event, uh, you would scan the different frequencies uh, to, to see who was there. So th they have these scanners, and the scanners today are much more sophisticated. Um, uh, you know, for those who uh, know of my uh, Seinfeld, uh, uh, some would call it obsession, but uh, my uh, liking of the Seinfeld, there's a Seinfeld episode where that Kramer gets a scanner in order to uh, listen to, you know, where the fire department is going, and then he ultimately joins or ends up driving the back of the fire truck in any event, the scanners. But, you know, is something like that uh, an invasion of someone else's privacy? Um, and, you know, this opens up the floodgates, especially these days in terms of with so much uh, media, so many me mechanisms for recording media, whether it be phone conversations or uh, images or videos. And some of these things are uh, desired. People want to put themselves out there. Uh, how does it work in terms of, of privacy? And so, in fact, you know, this was something that was discussed uh, around the same time as this Lakewood uh, Hatsala ad campaign, source number two. The flight tracker that powered Elon Jet just took a left turn, right? And so I would imagine some people here may have used it also. These days, you can flight any, you can track any flight. Um, you know, those of us who uh, live near JFK, you, know, you hear the noise. You want to identify the flight. You want to wave to someone you might know who's on it, right? You can identify all of this. And it's also helpful if you have someone who's on a flight. You want to know if they're going to be early or late or what exactly the position is because sometimes the airlines don't tell you. So how does that work? And, you know, what, 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 is, what does that mean for you know, the, the rights to privacy of some people who have uh, who can be tracked that way? So this is a, a, an article from Wired uh, Magazine or the Wired website, source number two. A major independent flight tracking platform, which has made enemies of the Saudi royal family and Elon Musk, has been sold to a subsidiary of a private equity firm. ADSB Exchange, like bigger competitors, Flight Radar 24 and Flight Aware, allows users armed with the aircraft registration details to follow planes, flight paths, and access historical travel data. That data, as Wired reported last month, is enormously helpful for plane spotters, open source investigators, and aviation regulators. ADSB Exchange is entirely user supported. Across the globe, volunteers set up receivers, which can be built or bought for relatively cheap, designed to receive real-time data from planes in mid-flight. They, in turn, feed that data into ADSB Exchange's software, which compiles the thousands of inputs and displays a real-time and displays a real-time map of all the world's in-transit flights. The standard exchange relies on automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, ADSB, is becoming increasingly ubiquitous and is mandated by FAA. It's that standard that has made ADSB exchange so reviled by Musk and the Saudis because ADSB is transmitted without encryption directly from the planes themselves. Censorship by the FAA on behalf of plane owners isn't possible. 
ADSB Exchange's administrators pride themselves on never hiding flight data. James Sanford, one of ADSB Exchange's senior administrators, told Wire their website has been used to track gold smugglers and kidnappers. It has been threatened by billionaires and warlords who aren't keen on having their private jets tracked. So there is, uh, you, you, you can't hide anymore. Uh, and this technology is unencrypted and, and it's mandated. So everyone has to have it and everyone can therefore, can therefore track it with the right receivers, the right software. And so uh, nothing is private anymore when it comes to this. And just to take this down uh, a notch, uh, to, to, to maybe on the personal level, you know, some of us don't have scanners. We don't necessarily uh, use, uh, we're not, we don't really care if anyone knows where our planes are, right? This was uh, from a website, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. What to know before you buy or install your Amazon Ring camera. So you own or are thinking of buying a Ring camera. This post outlines a list of privacy and civil liberties concerns we have with Amazon's Ring system so you can be a more informed consumer or if you already own a Ring camera, be a more considerate neighbor, right? You know, the, 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 the fact that people, you know, just the fact that you're going to record people walking by is an invasion of their privacy. Um, so there's a whole host of issues that emerge, especially with uh, technology and the way things are proceeding. And uh, you know, obviously, you know, some of these things are regulated. We know that you know, certainly in terms of uh, you know, having all of this stuff out there, have that, you know, certainly uh, creates a, 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 a noisier culture. But what about, what about privacy? How does privacy fit in uh, to all of this? Just we'll stop and take any reactions or questions uh, with regard to the presentation of the topic uh, from these uh, articles. It gives a whole new uh, meaning to the idea Big Brother is watching, right? You know, the, the, the Jewish version of that is the story they tell um, in, in the name of the Chafetz Chaim, who was once riding on a wagon uh, with someone, uh, and uh, the, uh, they, they, they had stopped, and uh, they had stopped in an orchard, and the person uh, got out to stretch his legs and there was uh, an apple tree there and he was very hungry and he figured, what's the big deal? Take an apple. And he says to the Chafetz Chaim, just please let me know if anyone is watching. And he, he goes to go over to take an apple and the Chafetz Chaim starts saying, they're watching, they're watching. And he runs back and he didn't see anybody. And he says, okay, thanks for the warning. If you see anyone, goes back to the tree. He's watching, he's watching. Guy runs back away, doesn't see anyone. Third time it happens, he's watching, he's watching. He says to the Chafetz Chaim, what's going on? Is someone there? Who's watching? He's like, Hashem, God is watching. All right, so we're, we, we never have a, a privacy because God is always watching. But what about privacy from others or from these unwanted intrusions uh, and the like? So the, um, you know, they, they, they're a couple, you know, we often hear about a, a right to privacy. Um, but sometimes the, the, the question also, what, what are the laws regarding privacy in this country? And also, what about uh, a Jewish take on this idea? Because very often Judaism doesn't speak in terms of rights. It speaks in terms of obligations. It's in terms of mitzvot, in terms of commandments, in terms of chiyuvim, in terms of halachot, in terms of laws and, and, and rules, and not just the idea of the, the right. So Rabbi Yitzhak Grossman, uh, in an article about uh, fair hearing. May one listen in on private conversations because this will uh, obviously impact uh, some of what we uh, laid out here this morning. As we have previously noted, privacy infringement may violate several halachos, including the following. The cherem attributed to Rabbeinu Gershom against reading the correspondence of others. Hezek Ria, damage caused by observing someone's private affairs. The prohibition gets used in someone else's property without permission. The ahafto kamocha, right? You shall love your fellow as yourself. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your friend. Unless, of course, we want to be spied on because we want the attention. Lo seilech you shall not go about gossiping among your people. So these, Rabbi Grossman lays out a number of uh, Torah and halacha concepts that impact this. And so let's look at, uh, let, let, let's go down the list. He first talks about the idea of the cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom. So the cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom, cherem literally means excommunication. And cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom, Rabbeinu Gershom was one of the uh, great scholars in the, the Ashkenaz region, uh, really uh, well known for his, uh, for, for, for a couple of rulings that he made. 
uh, in particular, uh, the were called haramim, uh, haram. And it's actually an interesting term because usually we think it means prohibition. Um, but it doesn't mean a prohibition. Rabbeinu Gershom never outlawed anything. Rabbeinu Gershom said that the violator would be excommunicated. And, and you know, we're talking around the turn of the millennium. He lived 960 to 1040. Uh, and his famous Rechelum Rabbeinu Gershom was that he was the uh, originator of the rule that if you marry more than one wife, then you are excommunicated. Right, the idea of you know the, in the Torah we know people had multiple wives. Uh, the, the patriarchs had multiple wives. So um, we, we, the, the Torah presents the, the scenario. So how do why is it so much? Uh, why is that basically virtually has that, that disappeared from the Jewish world? Um, you know, well, finally men wisened up and realized one is enough. That's you know definitely part of it also. Um, but uh, the other is that Rabbi Gershom came up with the rule that a man can have. Uh, only one wife. If he takes a second wife, uh, then he's put in cherem. So this stuck probably because it made a lot of sense, and maybe culturally and maybe socioeconomically, it, it seemed to work as well. And essentially, it's almost so people would say you can you're not allowed to marry two wives because of this cherem. But really, Rabbi Gershom put a, a person excommunicated anyone who would marry more than one wife. It remember Rabbi Gershom was in Ashkenaz, Germany, France. Uh, it took longer for this to spread into the Sephardic world. Um, I think the last to, to maintain this, you know, were in the Moroccan and Yemenite Jewish communities, in particular the Yemenites. So you can still have today people who remember, uh, you know, having a grandfather and multiple grandmothers, you know, in, in that Yemenite community. But for the most part, the cherem uh, worked. I mean, this is a the idea of a cherem of next communication working and being binding really requires the acquiescence in the collaboration, cooperation of a community to respect the harem. These days, we don't have the same communal formal structures. This is you know, what the what the uh, Jewish community, the Beit Din, the rabbinic community tries to do today when husbands refuse to give their wives a get. You try to use communal pressure. Communal pressure, I guess the expression would be, ain't what it used to be. Uh, but the idea, once upon a time, there was this communal pressure and it worked. And therefore, uh, we basically say only have one, uh, only have one wife. Uh, so, and this was, uh, but there was another uh, ruling of the Rabbeinu Gershom, source number five, a ban was proclaimed by the early sages against one who looks without consent at the writings one person sends to another. So this is uh, the idea that you're not allowed to read someone else's mail because that was all that, I guess, you know, they didn't necessarily have post office uh, the same way then, but you're not allowed to read the writings one person sends to another without consent. and. Um, this is another Chayim of Rabbeinu Gershom, and this one you know, obviously has impact on our discussion here this morning. So the idea is you, 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 there's a certain privacy that needs to be respected. So Rabbeinu Gershom didn't approach this as a Torah rule, but he, the, the idea of um, building upon some of the uh, Torah principles, right, 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 like not spreading gossip, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, would be one of them. If you have to, we'll have to explore is kind of a, a meta concept, right? We want we 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 want to be, we want to create bonds of friendship which don't involve spying on each other. Right? We'll come back to that a little bit at the end that it might be more of a, a social contract component. But here, if you're not supposed to be spreading gossip, if there's information that you don't know, Rabbeinu Gershon felt you're not allowed to do it. It's not addressed to you. You're not supposed to know it. If you re read it, you're put in cherem, and you're not allowed to read someone else's mail. Now. The, 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 the qualification opens up some uh, uh, some possible uh, openness in this. It says, uh, without consent, right? And so the Aruch HaShulchan, Rabbi Gil Michal Epstein, writing at the turn of the 20th century in Eastern Europe, uh, he says, I'm not so sure today in my time. People send letters out and they're not really fully sealed. If you can read them or not, because you don't completely hide it. And so the way where the Archa Shulchan is addressing a situation where the envelope's not sealed well. We're not talking about that it opens up, the envelope's not sealed well. He's like, in his time, it wasn't uncommon for information to be transmitted, to be passed from one to other without necessarily the sender being so careful. Uh, about the words uh, being read by someone else. You know, think, for example, the telegram. 
right? You know, Telegram, they, you know, you, you're transmitting a message. They know what's being said unless you try to encrypt it or send it out in code, right? Or HaShulchan was encountering a situation that things were being sent and they weren't necessarily being sealed. And even if there's a certain amount of privacy, well, if you really want it to stay private, what should you do? You should make sure it doesn't get read. And so he opens up the possibility if you don't work so hard to hide the information, then well, then maybe it's fair game to be able to look at that information. And, and in some ways, I think that that applies today that, look, you know, if you want things to remain private, you have to work at it, especially in a society where you know uh, things will uh, be able to be made public or you won't be able to hide certain things. And so while the Cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom in terms of not reading other people's mails is there that we can't, we can't uh, proactively invade privacy, but sometimes information, if you want to keep it private, maybe the onus is on the, on the individual to keep it private rather than on the voyeuristic tendencies uh, of the other. So that's the, the Cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom element, uh, contribution to the right to privacy. Questions, comments, reactions? Yes. Uh, um, I have uh, just one question. How is the um, the the harem different from a takana? So I, I think so. Part of it is linguistic. Uh, the the, the harem literally means excommunication. So he made a proclamation. He 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 established if you marry two wives, you're put in harem. That has been that has been taken as a as a I would say the, the, the appropriate linguistic formulation would be he was mitaken echerem, right? A takana can be a rabbinic enactment, can be a rule of the community, right? No, no high holiday seats if you don't pay your dues is a takana. Here is a takana of echerem being put in place. Um, and then the, 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 fact, the, the fact that it has such almost you know, universal acceptance um, you know, me, 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 puts the Takana concept in our heads also because he didn't he didn't say you can't marry two wives. He says if you marry two wives, you put in cherem. So that's kind of why it got the it's called the cherem instead of the Takana. So that is the the the, the right to privacy that emerges from uh, this uh, the the cherem of Beno Gershom as uh, as one of these factors with the right to privacy. So then there's an idea of Hezek Ria. Hezekiah is a concept that's introduced in the Gemara and Baba Basra, that uh, y- y- there's a certain type of, you damage someone by looking into their affairs. Um, whether this is a kind of metaphysical or spiritual ayin hara concept, or whether it's, whether it's, kind of, whether there's, kind of, whether there's real damage, or there's not, not real physical damage, but where there's some type of negative impact when people catch you spying on them, uh, the Gemara discusses, but it's certainly something that is introduced. And one of the rules of it is found in the Mishnah of Basra, source number seven. A person may not open up his windows, which means build an opening in a wall to use as a window. Right? It's not opening the window. You're not allowed to create a window. Uh, into a courtyard belonging to partners, a courtyard in which he is a partner. So the situation is I have a home and there's a, next, there's a courtyard nearby and that I own with someone else. I am not allowed to open up a window, create a window in my home to look into that courtyard, even though that courtyard partially belongs to me, if it's going to impinge upon the privacy of the other person. And, and this is all part of that Hezek Ria, because we have to respect privacy. And what comes to mind in this is where does this idea of uh, erecting the right type of spaces and not having the windows looking into each other, which is a biblical story where we get introduced to that, became part of our daily liturgy. Matovu alecha Yaakov, how good are the tents, uh, the dwellings of Israel, right? The, the, what Bilam said to the Jewish nation when he was sent by Balak to curse them, instead he blessed them. And uh, the, the idea, what, what was so great about the tents that he saw? You know, were they, you know, fancy? Were they, you know, chic? No, what was so, fa- well, what the understanding, the oral tradition accompanying those verses is that they each respected the privacy boundaries of the other. So no tent was looking into the, the other. And that is uh, what leads to a number of rules regarding where windows can be open. And in fact, even though I have a right, according to this mission, that courtyard belongs to me, but since it also will be negatively impinging upon someone else, uh, I, I am limited in what I can, uh, where I can have the windows open up uh, into uh, where will be others will see it. 
And here is a, a summary of the topic by Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Ladi, the Shulchan Aruch Harav, source number eight. It is self-understood that it is forbidden for an individual to look into a courtyard to gaze upon another's activities. Certainly peering into another's home without consent is forbidden. Even the one being monitors, even if the one being monitors sees the peeper and does not protest, it is still forbidden. It might be that the one being monitors to embarrass the protest. Even if one has permission from the neighbor to construct a window facing a courtyard, the permission pertains only to light gained through the window. It is by no means permission to stand at the window to gaze at the neighbor's activities. Uh, we, we are not supposed to be looking at the activities of other people. You know, what, what, what if they don't stop us? Well, that doesn't also necessarily seem to be uh, a good excuse. The idea is there's a certain space that uh, is considered, uh, in, in a sense, sacrosanct for the individual that you're not supposed to interfere in my space. And I don't even have to stop you from interfering in that space. You're, you know, you're supposed to keep, uh, you know, keep your eyes down, keep focused on your own. Uh, as my second grade teacher used to always like to say, MYOB, mind your own business. <laughs> There's a religious value in that. Not some. There are certain laws about that, halachot and baba batra, with regard to this concept. But in its implementation application, don't look. It's no one's business. You may want to. They may not want to stop you. They may be showing off or whatever. That still, you, we were supposed to remain more private, more inward directed. Rabbi Weinstock. Yes. It a reminder of that I, I, obviously Alfred Hitchcock did not read these laws when he wrote Rear Window as uh, ah. St James Stewart watched everything and pieced together all of the plots that were going on. Right. Well, well look, it, well, what's, well, what's interesting about this is that, you know, it, you know especially, you know, the, the, way, the way homes are constructed or in particular in, in, in cities with large buildings and their windows and, you know, the, the, you, know you, you have this level of proximity. It, it, it's, it's interesting that, um, that uh, it's actually not a crime to look into someone else's window. Um, it's a crime to raise their shades and look into their window, but it's not a crime to, 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 to look across the, the street into someone else's apartment. It's not a crime. It is a, Torah, it is a religious violation. And uh, this summarized an article, uh, a woman wrote about a, a situation uh, that, uh, that took place, but it has some interesting uh, numbers. Scott Burns, source number nine, executive director of the National District Attorneys Association, the Voice of America's 39,000 prosecutors said complaints like this, where one person is peering out of their window into another is aren't so rare. In fact, he says such cases are made every day, but they're not prosecuted unless there's a clear determination that the person being viewed has a reasonable expectation of privacy that has been violated. For example, he says someone standing naked on their lawn is not protected from being viewed. He said when a person repeatedly stands in front of an open window, they give up that expectation of privacy. In bigger cities like New York and Chicago, people with binoculars in their apartment frequently peer into adjacent apartments without being prosecuted, even if they're trying to get a glimpse of someone undressing, said Pauline Weaver, criminal defense attorney. Uh, she, along with many uh, attorneys interviewed for this article, never heard a case where someone is prosecuted for looking out of their own window. All right, so from a legal standpoint, you know, you seem to have a lot more leeway than from a Torah perspective, where the, the, this is considered a, a, a prohibited activity. Um, and, uh, you know, so there, there, there's, you know, so it could be that, you know, for, from a, you know, you know, is there, you know, to LS, like in the, you know, uh, Rosie, you know, maybe he, maybe it was important for him to piece it together. Maybe that, that was beneficial for someone. But here we see kind of this idea there's, an, there's a, a right to privacy, only if you can create expectation of privacy, if you put yourself in a situation where you can't expect privacy, like being up, you know, being outside or not without a type of a, a curtain or something like that, maybe you give up that expectation or that right. Um, and uh, Jewish law says otherwise. And if we apply it to, you know, some of, if we take this with regard to the, the you know, take like, 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 like the scanners or the flight information, well, look, um, you know, when it comes to the Chemer of Benu Gershom, if the letter is open uh, or the information is accessible, then it's not prohibited. But, uh, you know, when it comes from a, from a Torah perspective to, this information, you know, maybe is it meant, is it information I want out there? If I don't want the information out there, legally there may be difficulty in prohibiting it, but from a Torah perspective, 
Um, I, I'm not expecting you to take pictures of, my, you know, to take the ring camera pictures of the fender bender that took place in front of your house to post those online. Um, you know, while, you know, you, you know, from a from a, a, a American legal perspective, there may be very little that can be done. When I think about you know the way the the, the media has you know puts everything out there and how popular this is and all the various you know websites or uh, shows you know what, you know so I think what the, the the first you know conflagration on this issue that comes to my mind is in the aftermath of Princess Diana and the car crash and people took pictures right away they jumped into the wreckage right. You know, that might be a little bit, you know, that to me seems going way too far. No one really expects to have the, their picture taken while they're you know, sitting in a mangled automobile. But from a distance, you know, if you have those images, um, you know, from a legal perspective, there's uh, nothing that really can be done. From a Torah perspective, you have to, uh, it would seem to be you have to hold back. Um, so that is the issue with regards to, to Hezek Ria, Peeping Tom, you know, that type of an issue. Questions or comments or reactions? I have a question. So does it, does this apply also to someone who is out in public, doing things in public and let's say, you know, in, in, in sometimes in life we have to hire a private investigator, whether it's for business or, or something legal and they're, they're, acting in public, but they're being spied on and they're. So, so I think that the, 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 what, what could give us some, well, what could give us some instruction on that is the, what, what, the idea of TOELS. Right? If you go back in source number three, right. Rabbi Grossman mentioned some of the issues relating to privacy, he raised the issue of los telech rachil biamecha. You know, so so to accumulate information, if it's meant to be kept private, then then you're violating privacy to get the information is a problem. But if it's not being kept private, there is this kind of meta idea of why do you need to know? But if there is a toeles, if a person is you know potentially involved in something criminal, or you know, or, or if there's negative, if there's something wrong in a certain situation that, that that information is relevant to someone else, you I, I think you begin to counter that lo telech rachio. It's kind of it's a, it's a very interwoven matrix of issues. You know, so far, what we have seen is that when it comes to Judaism, seems to demand or expect more privacy. We we should not be as interested in the information, right? While secular law doesn't stop people from looking into other people's apartments, Jewish law would want would demand that we not look. And when it comes to just knowing information, if there's no purpose for it then uh, it's better not to be spoken of. But I think in, in your question, the idea of toeles emerges uh, for finding out. Also remember, if someone, you know, that also comes up with regards to Lashon Hara and, and Rechilos, right. people know about it already, right? If, if everybody knows, then it's not secret. Right? And if nobody knows and you're revealing the secret, that's a little bit different also. Right. But I think that, 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 that would be the principle that impacts that, uh, that question. Thank you. It could contradict with al tamod al damreecha too. It could be correct. Well, you know, the, 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 uh, of course, you can't stand by if something bad is happening. Obviously, you have to interfere, and that means sometimes you know, moving outside of your well, the dalit amos, right? That, that four cubits uh, uh, phrase, right? Everyone has four cubits. Or you have your own space, and that emerges from the rules law of Shabbos that you're allowed to move a little bit in every direction because your person is considered four amos uh, around. So, but sometimes you have to move beyond that. You know, on Shabbos you can't carry beyond that, but but um, but uh, sometimes you have to go beyond for the protection of others, for the benefit of others, etc. For sure. So the, the the question, and this is uh, you know you know relating to the scanners uh, uh, specifically, right? Hezekiah exists. You're not allowed to. You're not supposed to look because that's damaging, whether it's spiritually or emotionally, uh, you know, metaphysically. But what about listen? What about listening in? Is there Hezek Shmia? So. Um, so uh, you know. So so the the, the subject. Uh, is raised, and um, we see it. Uh, source number ten. Um, 
So uh, source number 10 is Rabbi Eliyahu Mizrahi. Um, and this, you know, takes us back, you know, to the, into the 15th and 16th century. So, um, Shema Minah, the Loch Hashin and Lishmiya, Shema Minah, Vetsar Lachalik Ben Chatzer Slavatim. He comes to the conclusion, you know, we're not worried about Hezek Shmiya in his, in his opinion, because if people are worried about a sound, then they'll speak more quietly. If you don't want something to be heard, don't say it out loud. So, you know, he says, you know, very, you know, in a straightforward fashion, you know, you don't want people to hear, don't say it. And therefore, there's no, you don't have to kind of somehow cover your ears and not hear things. You know, if, some, if you hear something, that's not your problem. That's the person speaking because they spoke it loud enough. So that's Rabbi Elio Mizrahi seeming to say that there is no Hezek Shmiya. So when the subject gets discussed more contemporarily, right, not in the 15th century, but in the 20th and 21st century, that seems to, it seems like the modern era has impacted the sensitivity and the fact that maybe people's filters aren't as good as they used to be, or maybe there's just so much more information and so many more conversations people are hearing. So this is a, a, a more contemporary analysis, source number 11, in a book called Emek HaMishpat. This is a place to protest over the plague that has spread even in our camp that there are those who listen to their fellows with all types of scanners and eavesdropping and listening devices of various sorts, or cordless telephones or babysitter devices and similar things. Through the wonders of technology, it is possible today to do with the utmost ease, and they do so for the purpose of industrial espionage in order to know the plans of their competitors and commerce and business. And this is sometimes done simply by people who are bored, and this is known. According to what has been established, this entails an absolute prohibition and the status of those who do so is the one who causes damage via slander, lishna bishna, by violating modesty and by preventing of others from being able to use their property is prohibited just like Hezek Ria, which is prohibited quite strictly by the Shulchan Ar. And this applies as well to those who break into computer codes or protect the database of information or the like who are called hackers. Their sin is severe, and we should add that they also violate the Golan Chem Rebbeinu Gershom, right, the opening other people's mail. And many stumble in this without paying attention and the practice becomes a hobby. And this is the way of the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination. So you know, we, we seem to be living in much more complicated times. And while Hezek Shmiya isn't a category that we can uh, elicit from the Talmud itself, nor does it seem to bother some of those uh, halakhic authorities you know, heading into the 15th, 16th century, by the time we get to contemporary times, when there are many more things that are attracting us towards listening in, or, um, you know, or we have to be very careful. You, know, you, you see, you know, obviously they talk about you know, he's aware of the fact that some of these have a certain toilets, have a certain purpose, right? You have uh, you know baby na nanny cams and baby monitors. There's toilets, but in general, this desire to always look and listen in. Uh, on things that are less of a concern to us is 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 religiously inappropriate, you know. So you know, you know, I, I would say that you know, if you go back to the way Rabbi um, <clears throat> Grossman summarized the, the, some of the Torah issues relating to this, well, we spoke about the cherem of Rabbi Gershom not looking into other people's mail or information. The idea of hezek ria, the idea of damaging. Uh, that comes from uh, looking, and the damage is not only on what happens to the other person, but it's a damage on our own morals and values. Then they talk about uh, using someone's property without permission, that uh, you have to be able to quantify what the property is. But I think some of the later shifting to being more concerned about this has to do with which are two meta principles. When I want people spying on me, then I shouldn't spy on them. Or the fact that if that, that, that irrelevant information almost is attached to a prohibition, there's no purpose, right? Why do I need all this nourishkeit anyway? Um, it seems that we've, you know, we've moved beyond the Rabbeinu Gershom or the Hezek Ria into more, some of these more meta categories. So um, here are a couple of um, case studies. Let's see what people think. So we'll start with what I think is a, maybe a, an easier one. And let's think about also secular law versus Torah law, based on what we've said. Is looking into another's private residence an improper invasion of privacy? 
Does it make a difference if one uses binoculars? What do you think? That seems to be going out of your way to try to uh, do something rather than having it, you know, just uh, by happenstance. All, right. All right. So I, I think it, it's definitely inappropriate, religiously prohibited. According to secular law, though, you no one's going to stop you because no one's going to prosecute you for this. And like we saw earlier, unless they do something to try and create a sense of property, it's not a privacy. It's not going to be a problem. What about using a nanny cam? to ensure the nanny is treating the children respectfully and nothing uh, untoward is happening in the household. Well, you're not lo only looking at the nanny, you're looking at your kids. So. Okay. Well, how about, do you, do you think legally, do you have to tell her? Halakhically, religiously, do you think you have to tell her? So legally, do you think you have to tell her too? No, it's in your dom domain. It's in your right. Right, but halakhically, you know, I, I think that they, we, again we're looking at this differently. You know, religiously there is this hezek ria that, 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 that watching someone else uh, without their knowledge. And we remember what, what the Shulchan Aruch said: even if they know but don't say anything, you're not supposed to. Right? That's without any type of toelas. But here, if you're doing it for a good, a valid reason, they certainly should have to know. Rabbi, here's a common one: all these. Uh parents today are tracking their children mm. where they are where they go where they're sitting right right so i think you, know, you have something and i think there that you have also the idea of is it is there to ls is there a positive purpose or a necessity involved in this uh something tells me there probably is yeah there it's is. not uh, you know look i i think you know what you know what what, what emerged um you know, with regards to, um, you know, the initial situation, like, you know, to keep track, to, to use this data so that you can track Elon Musk, for example, right? May, there may be a legal loophole, but that doesn't seem to be a, a religious loophole, right? That, uh, what, what's, the, what, what's the purpose, right? That you, you have access to information that has no purpose, that really is just, you know, voyeuristically letting you know where Elon Musk is. Do you really need to know? How badly do you need to know where Elon Musk is right now? You know, so that would be, you know, the, the, the type of where, you know, the, the, how are the tracking example for your kids? You want to know where your kids are. Elon Musk, you don't even know where Elon Musk is. It's kind of the idea you have access to information that hasn't been hidden from you, but wasn't necessarily proactively given to you uh, by the person themselves. Here's what an interesting about yeah. What about, what about an investigative journalist, a reporter whose job it is to find out maybe not, you know, inappropriate stuff, but to find out, but that's his job, his or her job to find out things about other people. Well, you, you, you open up, is it halakhically appropriate to be an investigative journalist? You know, maybe there's a difference between, you know, consumer products and page six. For those who don't know, page six is the New York. There Post. definitely is, by the way. <laughs> no, for sure. You know, it's 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 kind of, you know, and, and, and I think about it because I admit as chatai ani maskir hayom. I read the New York Post. Um, that uh, you, the people, you know, people are interested in the headlines. They're interested in the in page six. They want to, you know, it's 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 a welcome break to know, uh, you know, what what so and so is doing. Now. Does that make it religiously okay? You know, I don't know. No one's asked me the question about being a page six reporter, but you know, there, there is that that Jew, Judaism and journalism conversation. You know, that where Toelas enters, um, and, and some of this will enter as well. Because, for example, if your beat on page six is to track Elon Musk, um, you know, you may not be doing anything illegal. It may not be the best thing to do, but you're not doing anything necessarily wrong. It's interesting, just you know, get, getting information. That's not directly meant for you, but is but is assigned to you. And you may have seen this, you know, even in your own experience of reading documents. When you let's say you have a, a word document, you there's something called track changes or view markup, and like there could be multiple multiple versions of a document and all the different edits. And sometimes you, the, the, the edits you're trying to you know keep someone's identity out, but the original version had it in. So let's say you see all this, so they they call it metadata. 
It's information that's part of this document that wasn't meant to be in your version of the document. Um, are you allowed to read that? Right, I send you a document that we're talking about something, but then you, in one of the settings, you can read all the uh, 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 earlier iterations. I see you shaking your head. Why not? Oh, I, 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 you know, I didn't. If I wanted you to read the whole version, I would have sent you the whole version. Right. Right. That wasn't your intention. It was a mistake. Correct. So, uh, on the one hand. I sent you the data document. On the other, I didn't want you to see this part of the data. On the third hand, you now have the data. It's kind of, it's like it's kind of like the worst because I sent it to you, but you're not allowed to read it. It's 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 it's, it's the hardest of them all. So there's there, there's a lot of gray area here. Phyllis, uh, your hand is up. Yes, if um, sometimes we do it to ourselves. If I keep locations um, uh, settings on, so I can use Google Maps, you know, easily and not have to change my settings each time, I'm allowing myself to be tracked even though right. I may not want to. Right. And so, you know, that opens up the conversation that legally there's one thing, but you know, morally, halakhically, religiously, we're supposed to be more focused uh, on us and not on the other person, but correct. This day and age, allow push notifications, you know, all that stuff, uh, location, accuracy, et cetera. Any other questions or reactions? I wonder if the metadata question or sending something, um, uh, you know, falls under the uh, the shmia uh, thing that if you wanted, if you wanted to uh, to keep private, you could have restricted. Restricted view to uh, to other data that that, that that right, but you know that's that's kind of tech. right. <laughs> well, you know you you could keep it. You know, reading someone else. You know, what about reading your spouse's text messages? You know, you could say that if she didn't want me to, I wouldn't know her password. You know, that's especially these days when it's the face uh, ID on the phone. It's, you know, it makes it even more complicated. That would seem to indicate more of a desire to keep things private if it's uh, if uh, if it's that way. Because the only way to open the phone is with the face. Then, well, usually it's, it's two, you have one of the other options. So we, we see that there's, you know, there's clearly a, a secular line. There's a Jewish line. There's a larger, there's some gray area. But I think at the heart of this is... Um, Kind of, you know, the way that we, we saw that this is like it's about relationships you know, is something that is, you know, recognized in the in the behavioral sphere as well, in the psychological and behavioral sphere. So just, you know, a, a little excerpt from an author named Jeffrey Rosen, who wrote a book called The Unwanted Gaze, which is about having too much information out there remaining more private. Privacy protects us from being misidentified and judged out of context in a world in a world short of attention in a world of short attention spans, a world in which information can be easily confused with knowledge. Without a commitment to privacy, the Harvard legal philosopher Charles Fried has written in one of the most thoughtful essays on the subject: respect, love, friendship, and trust are simply inconceivable. It's the idea that from privacy we were able to develop. You know, more, stronger connections. The fact that we leave something that's we don't we don't put everything out there. It's not as because that makes things much more superficial. Right? This thing gets into really at the heart of the matter. Jewishly, what is the concept of sniut and modesty? The idea of keeping things to ourselves and recognizing those boundaries. That's where stronger uh, relationships uh, and deeper emotions are formed. Respect, love, friendship, and trust are inconceivable without privacy. And so in a world where everything is out there, then there's no ability to create those types of uh, those types of relationships. And so I think that that's uh, that, that type of behavioral and, and, and psychological approach to relationships very much validates the Jewish uh, ethos and all of this uh, as well. So while we track flights and uh, have our ring cameras and all sorts of mechanisms, you know, maybe there's a difference between uh, passive and proactive. 
uh, or, or there's something when it's when it's more in our territory versus trying to uh, impinge upon others, but recognizing this this right to this right to privacy, how it's able to also deepen relationships, uh, you know, remains you know a key principle to keep in mind.